Welcome to Bubble Street Books. Um, we're, we're very excited to have Sarah here. Her books are for sale right behind you. Um, she's going to talk about the history of winemaking on, finger, on the Finger Lakes, the last 150 years. About 150 years. So I'm going to cover it all. She's going to cover it all. A uh, great book, fantastic pictures in it. Again, Sarah Thompson, everyone. Thank you. I'm Sarah Thompson. I've been a freelance writer for the past four and a half years or so. And most of the writing I do is for Cornell University Publications. Uh, right now, um, the Agriculture and Life Sciences School, Human Ecology, uh, the Cornell Chronicle, um, the ILR School. And um, I'm also writing for Edible Finger Lakes right now as well. And uh, most of the, the topics I cover are science-related, uh, agriculture-related, some research. And I do obviously cover some wine and food as well, and business uh, in general. And so I've been doing that for the last four years. Before then, I was a full-time employee for Cornell University doing marketing and communications for a research center there. And I am not a native of the Finger Lakes. I'm a transplant from Virginia, but we moved up here in 2005, so it's hard to believe it's been a decade since we've moved. And uh, my husband and I really moved here to this region for a change of pace. We were both uh, living and working near Washington, D.C., and we're looking for a different way of life and both of us had a real interest in food and wine at the time and we're lucky to have family living up on Cuca Lakes. So we're very familiar with the area, the wine scene, and we thought it looked like a great place to be and very much more affordable than where we were at that, <laughs> at that point in time. So we moved up here with no jobs um, in the beginning and at that time I was actually working in professional kitchens cooking and my husband, a software engineer, actually came up to get a job in a winery. So that's how we started, and we settled in Trumansburg. So if we fast forward about nine years and a couple of children and a few career detours later, uh, we now live on Seneca Lake, as I mentioned, and we have about 11 acres that we had purchased around eight years ago that we intend to have a vineyard on and hopefully a small winery soon. And next spring is going to be the first half acre of Riesling grapes going in. So it took us a while, but we're finally, we're finally there. So the opportunity to write this book really um, dropped into my lap at a very busy time for us. We were trying to uh, build a house, sell a house, and um, I had uh, assignments that I was working on at the time, and I was approached by the publisher, um, and it sounded like a lot of fun and right up my alley because I love food, I love wine, I love the Finger Lakes, and I love research and history. So I thought, well, that would be a great project, but a lot of work, and at the time I didn't think I had the uh, bandwidth to take it on. But um, I said, keep me in mind, let me know if anything comes up, and you know, just keep me posted because they were talking to other people. And sure enough, a month later, I get an email saying, are you still interested because the author we contracted with pulled out? And I took that as a sign, and I said, sure. <laughs> so I'm not sure if it was the smartest idea at the time, but um, I took it on, and it took me uh, about exactly a year to write it to, from start to finish. So the, from the beginning of my research, um, and finding the images to submitting my um, manuscript to the publisher. So the book is called Finger Lakes Wine Country. It came out in March, published by Arcadia Publishing, which um, does all kinds of local history books, and this is part of their Images of America series, which generally uh, is the earlier history, uh, mostly black and white photos. These are all black and white photos in the book, um, and they usually cover the period after the advent of photography until sort of, well, as they put it to me, the beginning of color photography. Uh, but I pushed, when we were discussing what this book would be, I pushed to make sure that the history included the time period well into color photography, which would be after the 1976 Farm Winery Act uh, was passed in New York State, which is sort of a watershed moment in the more recent wine history of the state. So the reason the book, to me, was so daunting was because they were looking for Finger Lakes Wine Country as the title. And that could mean a lot of different things to different people. The Finger Lakes, if, if you're familiar with them, there's 11 total actual Finger Lakes. Um, and so were we talking about this entire region uh, that the 11 lakes were in? Uh, we were, were we talking about any specific lake? They really didn't know what they wanted to do. And so my suggestion was well, let's focus on where the bulk of the history is in the region and um, how other people describe the, the winemaking region. And Cornell, for example, does talk about the Finger Lakes wine region as encompassing four major lakes, and that's Canandaigua, Cuca, Seneca, and Cayuga. And they also happen to be the biggest of the Finger Lakes. So that's what I chose to do, is to use that definition of the lakes. And um, once that was sort of settled on, I needed at least 180 photos. But the thing is, I'm not a historian, 
I don't have a personal collection of archival photographs that go back to the 1830s. I don't work for a historical society. I don't work for a museum. Um, I don't have many friends that do. And so it was a very, the task for me was where was I going to find these photographs and how was I going to amass them all in enough time to make this book a reality. And for me, that basically meant that I went to every possible public source of photographs that I could find. And so I would get into my car and drive to the Curtis Museum in Hammondsport with my portable scanner and go through their boxes of their catalog, although many things are in boxes in, in a lot of museums and historical societies because of the time it takes to go through a lot of the material they get, and sifted through things and scanned them on site when I was there in order for them to be digitized for the book. And that, that took me about four months. So I started with museum, local museums and historical societies, and then I went to local winemaking families, um, the Hazlitts, the Fulkersons, the Wagners, um, some folks in Canandaigua. I went to the old Widmer facility in Canandaigua and went through some of the most amazing things I've ever seen in a collection that is not being shown to the public. And I just did it all in the hopes that whatever I would find would be worthwhile because my goal was not to just get X number of photos and then put them in the book and then write captions to describe what the photos said. Um, my goal was to first tell the chronological story of Finger Lakes grape growing and winemaking and then find, hopefully find photographs that would be very representative of different times and periods and what was happening at that time. And so I'm not sure if that's different than other people when they're doing these books, but um, that's what I was hoping. I was hoping to find some great images to really illustrate the story. So that was the focus as I was working on the book and it really guided me while I was doing the research and as I was, you know, deciding on the final images. And the hardest part was really accepting that I could not cover everything. Um, I certainly, this book is not a comprehensive guide to every winery in the Finger Lakes. It's very much a history book. And, um, and that's fortunate and unfortunate, but I had to make decisions about what not to include, and that was really difficult. Because I have some really cool photos and other information that I would have loved to put in. Um, so the book Roughly, uh, it's a, divided in chapters that roughly follow the chronological history of grape growing and winemaking. And so the first two chapters, the first chapter begins about 1836. And as I said, I go up to about the 1980s. Um, and it's a little bit broader than, again, you'll see in most books like, like this, I think. Um, but I really start with the beginning of viticulture in the Finger Lakes. And that generally, we can say, started on Cuker Lake. And viticulture is just the science of... and practice of grape growing. And a lot of people are familiar with the story. I don't know of, of a Reverend Boswick in Hammondsport, perhaps, perhaps not. He is credited with um, planting the first cuttings of native grapes in his backyard in Hammondsport. I think they were Sweetwater and Isabella. Those are some old hybrid uh, grape varieties. And I think he intended to make wine with them. That's the thought probably at the time. Uh, but Really from there, though, it, it gets pretty intense in Hammondsport. And the Hammondsport wine business, as of say, 1860, was the, the year the first winery was founded. The first New York State bonded winery was founded in Hammondsport, and that was the Pleasant Valley Wine Company. And this was no um, small farm winery with a couple of acres of grapes, and they decided they were going to make it into some wine. The thing that struck me the most about these early wineries from the 1860s to the 1890s was about the boom of when they started to just, you know, there was 20 alone in Hammondsport by the time Prohibition rolled around, 20. They were making hundreds and thousands of gallons of wine and, and sparkling wine and champagne. And it really starts to boggle your mind when you think about what we have today um, because if you look at, for example, Pleasant Valley, they were making in 1864 30,000 gallons of wine which is about little like 13,000 cases. That's just their second, or, you know, not very far into their, their lifespan at that point. And, if, and along with sparkling wine, which was there, they called it champagne, which you can't do now in the United States because it's, if it's not made and grown in the Champagne region of France, um, they were making lots of sparkling wine, and they were making still wine out of uh, the native grapes, and they were also making brandy. And brandy is probably one of the most common products that these early wineries were making. It was much, a very common drink at that time. Um, and now, today, um, some of the distilled beverages and made from grapes 
are coming back into this region we're seeing now. But it was a very common part of, of the winemaking portfolio at that time. Um, so in 1884, which is not that long after Pleasant Valley gets going, there's another winery, Germania Wine Company in Hammondsport, that are estimated to be making 100,000 gallons of wine annually. That's about 42,000 cases. And if you think about those numbers today, Wagner Vineyards, which is one of the larger ones in our area, in our region, is making about 50,000 cases annually. And Swedish Hill, which is probably even, even larger, I would say, on Cayuga Lake, they're making about 60,000 cases annually. And, and they're some of the largest. Glen Glenora would be up there, too. But compare that to in 1884, what they were producing. And a lot of it was, as I said, sparkling wine made in a very traditional method, this, this méthode champenoise, very time-consuming, very expensive method of making champagne where um, the wi still wine is actually fermented a second time in the bottle so that the, that's what gives it the bubbles, uh, the carbon dioxide is being released and you have to age it over on, on its side for years and then you have to disgorge it appropriately so that the uh, yeast doesn't get into the, you know, so it's clarified. Um, and local people, it was not being sold to local people driving around doing a wine tour. Um, to, to these places. It was being sold to uh, big city markets, um, whether it was being transported on steamboats up the lakes or the uh, railroads, eventually the railroads specifically, but, and winning awards in uh, Europe. So the beginning was pretty big um, in the region, and it, and it didn't, it was really focused on Canandaigua and Cuca Lake for a very long time. There was only one, as far as I could find, any, only one winery on Seneca Lake, um, and that was uh, the Seneca Lake Wine Company. It was founded in 1867. Um, and they're the only winery that existed until the 1976 Farm Winery Act, which seems odd because now the region very much, a lot, many of the wineries are focused on the Seneca, around Seneca Lake right now. Um, or I guess the concentration of wineries seems to be increasing, although it's, you know, it's spreading out. But um, at that time, on Seneca Lake, there were a lot of other things going on, peach growing, peach orchards, apple orchards, a lot of orchard fruits, cherries um, were very, were being grown in places where today they would have uh, vineyards. So there were other, there were other agricultural products that they were, that they were, you know, growing that were more lucrative at that point. Um, so basically the first chapter, I go into the beginning of the wine, the beginning, the first wineries, essentially, that uh, sprang up in the region. And in chapter two, I talk about the table grape mania, which um, I think a lot of people have probably seen the very beautiful uh, grape labels. I don't know if you have seen them, but they're, many of them are their paper labels, and they are about this long. And they are placed on, I have a picture of it right here. Um, they're placed that you probably can't see very well, but if you buy my book, you can. <laughs> on top of these baskets called pony baskets. And when the railroads finally came to many of the, to Hammondsport and to Seneca Lake and, and refrigerated cars came along, it was much easier to transport fresh produce to cities without them turning into complete mush or freezing along the way. Or, so the more temperature control meant that there was more opportunity to sell the fresh fruit. And so the grape growers who were selling a lot to the wine companies, maybe a, a third of their crop was going to the wine companies, they had enough where they could sell to other markets too, and now they could get it there in decent shape. And so the mania for fresh grapes really took hold in the 1880s, 1890s. And so you start to see the boom of other industries and sort of, uh, yeah, chapter two shows the basket making that came about in Penyan. There were a lot of basket makers. Um, supposedly there's a story that the, uh, there was a basket maker in Penyan who's responsible for the invention of the basketball hoop using a basket, a true basket. I'm not sure if it was a Climax basket. That's the name that they gave to them. But that's a story that I heard. I didn't follow up on that for this particular book. But um, so you had um, the people harvesting ice from the, from the lake and storing them in ice houses. You had the basket making. Marketing cooperatives and grower cooperatives started to spring up, too, as more demand and competition uh, happened amongst growers for, uh, you know, being able to sell their, their produce in specific markets. Um, and that really lasted for quite a while, basically until prohibition came about, because at that point, truckers were coming in. The market for these um, pretty packaged baskets arriving by rail car was sort of disintegrated. 
Uh, there wasn't really a huge demand for it, and truckers could just come and pick up huge huge bins of them and get them to markets a little bit <coughs> faster. And also at that point, people were interested in bulk <coughs> grapes for other reasons, um, because as Prohibition dawned, they found that they could purchase bulk grapes and make about 200 gallons of their own wine at home with them. And <coughs> you didn't need them to look pretty um, if you were going to do that. So. <laughs> Um, so that during that time, uh, there was a huge planting over in Seneca County. So between Seneca and Cuba Lakes, I, I couldn't find much winery activity going on until quite later. Um, and I don't know why that is. Um, there was a small company, I think, that was making brandy near Waterloo. Uh, but basically, at some point, they got turned on to the Niagara grape, which was developed in, I think, 1873 out in western New York. And Niagara is a hybrid grape. And they were growing it for table table eating. And um, there were thousands of acres planted between uh, Seneca and Cuga Lake in Seneca County, um, where the deep, many areas where the depot is now. Um, there's a vineyard road up there. And um, people, it was big business. There were stock corporations formed, um, you know, and it was kind of a gamble for a lot of the farmers because they maybe had never, no experience growing grapes. And so a lot of, a few big companies owned a lot of, acreage at that point, and they never quite made their money back, um, it seemed, on, on most of those um, on most of those ventures. But um, So that's chapter one and two. Chapter three, I go into a little bit of the, um, the process of making wine, and I felt like it was important that people who read the book, if they were going to read the book and not just look at the pictures, um, kind of understood the process of making wine. And I know that sounds simplistic, but um, the pictures I chose really follow it from the vineyard to the cellar and give an idea of what it was like to make wine in the late 19th, early 20th century um, in the Finger Lakes. And, um, you know, from the planting to uh, the things that were going on at uh, the Geneva Experiment Station in Geneva, uh, where a lot of uh, work was being done on how to protect grapevines from all kinds of diseases. Um, really early photos of uh, folks out on a sprayer, a horse-drawn sprayer from, you know, 1910. And we think of a lot of this stuff that we or vineyard people do as being sort of new, you know, new technology, but that kind of stuff was going on for a long time uh, because the people, in, the growers in this region have always sort of faced similar challenges from um, powdery mildew disease, uh, pests, and other things like that. So it's kind of part and parcel of growing grapes. It's a very risky business. Um, so there's a lot of research being done in Geneva on that, and then, um, you know, by the time the wine, you know, the, the grapes get to the, to the wineries, uh, Again, the scale of what they were doing, the amount of grapes they're pressing in these giant hydraulic presses um, kind of blew my mind <laughs> when you see it. And these under, underground caves where they have um, the champagne, many of them have their sparkling wine uh, laid. It's called en tirage, which is just a second, ferment, for, second fermentation and, and aging laid down um, sideways. So they have to stack them up um, to do that. And, and people are down there uh, with candles perched on the <laughs> the edge of their uh, where, where the bottles are being kept and or a single uh, gas light lantern hanging down and I'm trying to imagine what that would be like day in and day out um, so really by the time you get to chapter four to six you're like oh well, what's going to happen next because you know we had all this great stuff going on in the Finger Lakes from the 1830s until the early 1900s and then prohibition sets in which is sort of where uh, chapter four through six, it starts with prohibition, so it's sort of the rise and fall and rise and fall of the industry. And um, prohibition uh, dawned, I think it was in 1919, and the wineries that had a lot of resources in the area survived pretty well because they were able to make uh, wine and sell it as legal sacramental wine and um, medicinal wine, if you had a prescription. And uh, then they got into the business of selling fresh grape juice, wine-type grape juice, which um, very openly and blatantly would be sold to customers for their personal use, um, not necessarily with instructions on how to ferment. In some cases, they did, um, but basically wineries like Taylor in the, during Prohibition was selling their wine types to consumers in very handy um, barrels of all kinds of dis different sizes, up to 50-gallon barrels that you could take home and drink yourself or, or ferment it and then drink yourself. So they found ways to survive. Uh, Widmer made every possible product out of a wine or grape that it could. 
Um, and by the end of Prohibition, um, I believe there are about seven wineries, 1933, there are about seven wineries left with licenses uh, in the Finger Lakes, in these four lakes, which is pretty amazing given how many there were, just as I mentioned, in Hammondsport alone uh, prior to 1919. Um, and, uh, and so what happened is the biggest ones survived, the four biggest ones, the Pleasant Valley Wine Company, Gold Seal Wine Company in Urbana, the Widmer Wine Cellars um, in Canandaigua, and the Taylor Wine Company in Hammondsport. And then they, people started to look to consolidate. So the Taylor Company was the first company to consolidate. They purchased Pleasant Valley, and that sort of began the <laughs> downward spiral of the industry. So by the 1960s, in the middle of the 1960s, um, not only Taylor, eventually the Taylor Pleasant Valley Company was bought by another company. Large national companies, for the most part, came in. Um, Seagram's bought Gold Seal, and they kind of ru they ruined most of them. And so basically at that point, none of those national companies wanted to make wine with native with New York grapes, which was the foundation of the industry prior to that. And so they were using California juice, they were using California grapes, and the grape growers in New York had no market. Um, they had had contracts with these growers for years and years and years. And I think by 1984, I think, was the year that, all, that those wineries that remained canceled all their contracts with grape growers um, so that they had nowhere to sell them. But prior to this, <laughs> there was a movement, which by the time we get to Chapter 6 and 7, there was a movement of people not only wanting to help the growers find a way to maintain their businesses and maintain their farms, but also there are people kind of like there are now, I'd say today, kind of coming to this area who are really interested in wine, who were kind of feeling like they wanted to get back to the farm, back to producing something uh, from the land, being involved in it. And this was sort of the mid-70s. And the two groups kind of came together and at a time when the, the New York State government, I guess, was also looking at what it could do to help these farmers and this is the beginning of the Farm Winery Act um, movement, which basically allowed a grower who had a, a, an active vineyard to grow their own grapes and crush and make their own wine on their property and then sell it directly to customers from their farm, which was revolutionary at the time because prior to that, a winery license was a very complicated, expensive thing to obtain and um, not something that most small growers could, could do. So that really kind of opened the floodgates for a lot of small businesses, and many of them multi-generational farms, to survive and kind of find a way out. But what happened after 1976 is very different than what had come before. There are no large corporations like there were in the 1860s and 1880s um, in Hammondsport who are making the amounts of wine and shipping them like they were. So the numbers are increasing, the volume is increasing, but the emphasis has been more right now on more small family farm type businesses um, and even micro wineries uh, popping up to be able to make and sell wine directly to consumers. So, and I'm, I'm skipping over a whole part about um, sort of the visionary winemakers, and there is, there is a chapter on them. Um, there's names you'll probably recognize, like Dr. Constantine Frank at Dr. Frank's Vinifera Wine Cellars, and um, they're on Cuca Lake, and then Walter Taylor's Bully Hill on Cuca Lake as well, and then Charles Fournier, um, who was the winemaker at Gold Seal on Cuca Lake. So there's all kinds of stories about Walter Taylor. He was the son of the original owners of the Taylor Wine Company, about what he did and what he brought to the scene. He was known as a flashy kind of... Um, troublemaker in a lot of ways for his family he was a troublemaker but one of the interesting things about doing the research on them that I found was that he was first and foremost a 100% proponent of wine made in New York from 100% New York grapes and he fought for that from the beginning with his family was fired for it and started his own business doing it and he didn't agree with what kind of grapes <laughs> would make the best wine or be the best product for New York consumers. But he thought it was French-American hybrid grapes, which are simply, um, they're, they're called French-American hybrids. They're hybrid grapes. They take two different varieties, hybridize them, and get another uh, variety that is, um, has different characteristics. Many times better characteristics than the parents do. And it started in France with some French growers doing that with 
crossing vinifera or European traditional European wine grapes with um, American native varieties, but not with Labrusca. And I'm not going to get too too into it, but there are all kinds. There are several species of native American grapes. Um, one of them is called Labrusca, which is known for its very foxy um, aromas and tastes. And if you've ever had a Concord wine or a Niagara wine, even a Delaware wine, which is another variety, you might notice that. I can't even describe to you what the foxiness is. Many people can't. They just call it foxy. Uh, but it's very different from, say, a Pinot Noir or a Merlot or um, a Riesling-type aroma. And so these French growers were trying to fight disease problems, and they were looking for ways to do that by hybrid, hybridizing, and they were crossing some American species that were not Labrusca, because they didn't want those foxy aromas with um, some French, or, excuse me, not French, but European wine grapes. And so they were looking for good grapes, make, it makes grapes that make good wine. And so this is what Taylor set his sights on. And that's what Bully Hill was founded on. He ripped out all his native grapes and put in um, hybrid, uh, beginning with French American hybrid. And that's actually what Charles Fournier at Gold Seal started with as well. It was sort of a revolution. Um, it was an accident that these French American hybrid grapes were cold hardy. So they survived the winters, but that's not why the French growers had grown them or hybridized them. They uh, had other reasons. It just so happened that this was another characteristic that they got, and it was very beneficial to New York State growers. And so Charles Fournier started there at Gold Seal, but then he believed um, that, and he was an experimental guy. He said, I think we should try vinifera. He was French. Um, and, and I think his goal was to make the best wine he could. So um, he finds a guy who's sort of like-minded, and that's Dr. Frank. And Dr. Frank's working at the experiment station in Geneva. He worked there for two years before he worked at Gold Seal. He worked in propagation, um, which is uh, nursery work, basically, probably grafting vines or taking cuttings. Um, and he was uh, not a janitor at the Geneva experiment station, which is a story I've heard a lot. Um, I was surprised. I actually found the documentation that showed how much he was paid by, <laughs> by the New York State Experiment Station. But um, he believed that it could be done because he grew up where it was really, really cold in the Ukraine, and they had vinifera grapes there. And they grew, and they uh, made wine out of them, and everyone said it's too cold. But that's not the only thing. The, the New York State Experiment Station started experimenting with vinifera in 1902, and they never stopped, really. But they never could come up with a business case to recommend growing vinifera to New York State growers. And that's what the experiment station was largely for, was to help um, the growers. So Dr. Frank and Charles Fournier found each other. And basically, uh, Charles hired him to do that experimental vinifera work um, at Gold Seal. And that's where Dr. Frank spent most of his career once he came to the U.S., and this is something I also didn't realize, that his own winery, which he founded, I think, in 1962, was pretty much a retirement project <laughs> for him. He was already well um, advanced in age at that point, and it's interesting because he, he ran his winery like an experiment station, hundreds of varieties he planted and experimenting with different rootstocks, and, um, and the rootstocks are just the rooting portion of the plant uh, versus the, the scion, which is the fruiting portion of the plant. And you can graph those two together so that you get the characteristics of the rooting portion, like disease resistance, for example, and it doesn't change the, the fruit itself, but you get um, benefits from that. And a lot of um, orchard work is also based on grafted, uh, grafted trees. Um, so those visionaries kind of came along in the mid-60s. Um, and so Dr. Frank's vinifera wine cellar is in 62, and I think Bully Hill in 60. Six or 67 were the first two independent wineries in the Finger Lakes for like 20-some years, um, and the only ones until the 1976 Farm Winery Act. That was quite a drought for us Finger Lakes wine drinkers, I would have to say. So by the time this book ends, you know, we kind of are where we are today in some ways. So going from about two independent wineries in the Finger Lakes by the late, by, you know, by the mid-70s, to I think there's, the latest count is 136 uh, wineries and tasting rooms on the Four Lakes right now, and counting, because I think that's going up. Not to mention cideries, breweries, distilleries. Um, a lot of the industries that were 
frankly, around probably in the 1860s that sort of were serving local communities and now they're coming back. So that about wraps it up for me um, as far as what this book is about. Really my hope is that it provides people who live here but also visitors with kind of a better understanding of the region, you know, how it started and really where, where its place is in American wine history, um, not just sort of an idiosyncratic little region that happened to grow grapes and make wine because it really does have quite, the connections in its history are very far reaching today. So thank you. I'm curious as to where you think the wine industry here is going to go. I mean, we've seen this um, sort of upscaling the past, say, 20 years. Mm -hmm. The wine has gotten better, perhaps? Well, there's a couple things. One, in general, winemaking practices have gotten better around the globe. So quality, wine quality, has also gotten better. And it's not just that people's tastes have changed and we don't like sweet plonk like we used to. Um, there was a reason there was sweet plonk. You, you couldn't do some of the things you can do today to make a clean, sterile wine that has lower alcohol and no sugar, for example. Just chemically speaking, chemistry comes into play there. So today, with the cleanliness of the winemaking, uh, the different practices, it's much more available to winemakers to do that with any kind of grape, whether it's a vinifera grape, we consider like a high-end wine grape, or a native grape even. Um, when we first moved up here, I remember thinking that we were at the, be you know, kind of the beginning of this boom, and I, I look now and I think, that, well, this region in particular has, I think, the it most diverse, largest number of varieties being uh, planted and made into wine than I think any in the United States. Um, and I mean, it's, it's crazy. And it's still being made into wine. It isn't like they've just switched or ripped out all their vines or, you know, it's still being made into good, uh, good wine for, pe for people who enjoy that kind of wine. I mean, so the variety that's out there is really great. And I think that people, some people in the industry think that's a downside that there's too much variety and we, we, that means we can't focus on the quality um, European grapes that are in general more prized and praised than others. But I think it's actually what makes this region pretty unique. And I think that um, it would be a shame, frankly, if, if it became all one way. Like if, we, if everyone tried to, if everyone decided their goal was to be um, a, I don't know how to describe this, but, you know, to be a, a, only offer $35 bottles of Riesling at the most expensive restaurants in New York City or exporting it overseas. And if everyone had that goal, I think that a lot of consumers would, would miss out. They wouldn't have the opportunity to, to um, experience what they can right now in the Finger Lakes. What are the markets for Finger Lakes wine? Like cities and, and states or towns? Overall, I mean, what are the different segments? Uh, well, I, I think that the New York Wine and Grape Foundation would tell you, and probably most of the wineries would tell you, that they the ones that have tasting rooms on the lakes do a substantial amount of their business through that tasting room. So direct sales to customers for people who have invested the money to be on the trail, on the lake, in their facility, during the season, they're making most of their money. Um, they, many of them have online stores, and there are still rules, very convoluted rules about selling to other states, selling to people living in other states. It's available to some, not to others. Um, a lot of them are, frankly, I mean, they're in local wine stores. Some of them have re the distributors, and it's still a process where they have to go through a distributor to get into certain markets and that is eating into their profits. So many of them, especially small ones, will try to avoid that. So they'll hand sell it to restaurants, local restaurants, to local wine stores, and you know, to customers at the tasting room. And then some of them go to farmer's markets and sell their wines, especially the smaller ones, direct to consumers there. Um, there are smaller distributors that are popping up to sell sort of these boutique wineries or cideries in markets like New York City. So they're sort of helping these 
folks get into to places like that. But I mean, there's wine stores in Virginia. My parents can buy um, New York State, you know, Finger Lakes wines now. Um, it just depends on the winery's relationship and use of a distributor at this point. Um, and there's still a big kerfuffle about whether winery, wine will be able to be sold in grocery stores. Um, and there are several wineries that have gotten flack for being on one side or the other. And uh, I think that's a very tough position to put them in because um, the, this, at this stage, they need distributors. How did you decide to come up with the cover image? Was there so much going on in that photo and you felt it deserved the cover? Well, um, it was very clear for a photo from that era. Um, the clarity of it really makes it for me, and, and also just what they're doing. This is the champagne bottling line at Gold Seal in probably 1880. Um, and you'll see other pictures in the book that they're doing pretty much exactly the same thing in like 1937. You know, including the disgorging into a barrel. I mean, some of the, the processes really didn't change. And so this was kind of a, to me, captured know kind of captured what, what we were doing here as far as looking at the book and looking at the past like that so um, and I just love the machinery the look on their faces they, they're all dressed so nicely and all these photos even the ones out I mean, when they're out in the vineyard um, hauling grapes they're wearing you know their bowler caps and uh, the women actually are the ones doing all the picking and um, hauling but um, they're dressed of course nicely too